This is CBC Here and Now. Tonight, he's described as the getaway driver. One of the men behind a violent home invasion in paradise pleads for leniency and sexual harassment, intimidation, and bullying. That's free of intimidation, harassment, and sexual harassment. An outside investigation finds trouble inside Munn's Medical School. Good evening, I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Marianna Kelland. Well, three men convicted in multiple violent home invasions will soon learn their fate. Mass gunmen barreled into two Paradise homes the winter before last, pistol whipping one victim. Mitchell Nippert, Tyler Donahue, and Abdefada Muhammad will be sentenced for those crimes next week. Here now is Megan McCabe was at Provincial Court in St. John's today. So Megan, what kind of jail time are they looking at? They're all in Her Majesty's Penitentiary in St. John's now awaiting those sentences. Uh, Mitchell Nippard, the Crown is asking for 10 to 12 years for him and his lawyers countering with 6 to 7. Tyler Donahue and Abdi Fattah Mohammed both had their sentencing hearings today in Provincial Court. The two home invasions happened two nights in a row back in February 2017. First, a house on Milton's Road where a family was zip tied on Angel's Road the next night where a woman was home alone with her baby. That's the night the men were arrested. Now, the men say that these were targeted attacks on drug dealers, that they went in looking for drugs and whatever they could steal to get drug money. This morning started with 24-year-old Tyler Donahue, who's convicted of two charges on the Angels Road invasion. He didn't go in and is described as the lookout or getaway driver. Both lawyers agree, and he says in court today, that he can turn his life around. He has family support, he struggles with ADHD and drug addiction, and he says he may be bipolar. The Crown thinks he should get five to seven years, and his lawyer thinks three to four less time served. So, Megan, the situation is different for the other accused man, Abdi Fattah Mohammed. It is. He went in both homes, and he actually hit one victim with a handgun. And Mohammed ha also has a lengthy criminal record, convicted of manslaughter and spending a lot of time in federal prisons. The 28-year-old man who came to the province from Ontario, where his mom lives, is convicted of 14 charges between the two home invasions. So with his record of violence and his role in the crimes, the Crown says rehabilitation is less and less likely for him and suggests 12 to 14 years less time served. Mohammed represented himself this afternoon, talked about how his bipolar disorder affects him, how he wants to stay on his medication and become a productive member of society. But the court ran out of time. So Mohammed is set to finish his submissions tomorrow morning and tell the judge what he thinks his sentence should be. Then the judge will make his decision and deliver these sentences for the three men next week. Debbie and Arianna. Thanks, Megan. Well, the family of Trevor Hamlin say they feel like they're no closer to finding the missing man. Hamlin, who's also known as Pepsi, was last seen at his home in Paradise on June 16th. Numerous air and ground searches have only turned up an old phone. Now Hamlin's sister says the family plans on meeting someone who knows what they're going through. I want to talk with the police a little bit more. We've been working very close together. I'm also going to start speaking with some of Courtney Lake's family, try to get some input from them, because obviously they have been through this, unfortunately, and they're more experts than I am in this. Protesting electrical workers on the Avalon are accusing their union of corruption. They're pushing for a new executive. They claim election interference, the mismanagement of funds, and rule breaking has caused near bankruptcy for some members. Here now's Katie Breen reports. Well, about 30 union members set up outside the IBEW main offices in Holyrood today, unhappy with the current leadership and looking for change. The collective agreement for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers Local 2330 says hiring is shared. The contractor picks an employee, the union picks an employee. Protesters say the union is supposed to use a running list so work is shared fairly, but claim that isn't happening. We've got people who have been without work for years, cannot get a job, while other, other members can work continuously for years and years and years on end. As I'm sure everyone's aware right now, the, uh, the economy in, in our province, it's, it's very competitive 
uh, and there's not a lot of work out there right now. Protesters say Baker is keeping financial documents from union members. When you can't see the reports, the, the natural assumption is that there is something wrong. And that's what the natural assumption is here, that there is something wrong. Our audit is available to any of our members to see any time. Uh, they just have to make an appointment. Uh, I have a very busy job, so they can't just show up unannounced. They make an appointment and I'll definitely meet with anybody. Protesters say they wanted to deal with the problems internally, but those efforts were thwarted when 16 members who had the potential to oust those in power were disqualified from running in an election. They say their involvement in a Facebook group critical of Local 2330 was to blame. That's because some of the 1,300 group members used inappropriate language to vent their frustrations. Every anyway, three months. No, no, TV we'll, we'll TV try TV to TV keep TV some TV of it. Local 2330 President Ann Gehan refused CBC's request for an interview, but did meet with protesters. According to the group, the union's international VP was called during that meeting, and the disqualified candidates were reinstated. Well, they're new blood. Everyone that was qualified was new blood. So, you know, it was a, it was a last ditch effort to maintain power and hopefully get new people in. No date has been set for an election, but members say it should happen immediately. Katie Breen, CBC News, St. John's. Well, as you can see from Katie's story, not a bad day in the St. John's area. Very muggy, humid weather. Yeah, we did see some sunny breaks, but we managed to dodge some of the showers. And tomorrow, you know, in the St. John's area is looking very similar to today. But I'm going to start with a look at the heat warnings that are still in place for Corner Brook straight on over to Bonavista North. So temperatures there in the upper 20s with the Humidex in the mid 30s. And we also still have that fog warning in place for the south coast. So some very dense fog along the south coast. If you're traveling in that area, you'll want to keep that in mind for sure. And we still have a heat warning in place for the southeastern coast of Labrador in through Churchill Valley. Now tomorrow we do have this cold front that will be uh, moving in, dropping down some of those temperatures in Labrador and bringing lots of rain to Happy Valley Goose Bay and as well to the south coast of the island. So when you wake up tomorrow morning, this is what you are going to see if you're in St. John's early tomorrow morning, you're going to hit 17 degrees with some cloudy skies, a chance of some drizzle uh, for the Buren and South Coast. There's uh, that drizzle and fog keeping temperatures pretty low uh, down there, but a really nice day shaping up in the morning for central western Newfoundland and southern Labrador. I'll have uh, more details on what tomorrow has in store a bit later. It's a bit of fun to raise, raise money for a good cause. Something a little bit out of my range, but uh, you know, it's all a good fun. Well, the glittered beards and flashy tails are back. The Merbys return to shoot their new calendar. That's in 20 minutes. And 46 years ago, Leo Bowen gave his life to save another at sea. Today, his sacrifice was recognized with an award from the Red Cross. I'll have that story coming up on Here and Now. An outside investigation of Munn's medical school has found signs of intimidation and harassment inside the program. The report was released yesterday after a six-month investigation. Here now's Malone Mullen has details and the reaction. They're here to become doctors of the future. Nearly a thousand students guided by an even larger faculty, but for some their time here is spent in distress. An external investigation ordered by the school in November dug up some problems. In all, over two dozen complaints by students who had witnessed or been the target of bullying. Some students reported being picked on, yelled at, and the object of personal comments about race or size. There were also sexual harassment allegations. The report said one student was told not to go into surgery because it is too stressful she looked more like a family doctor, and besides that, she might be a distraction in the operating room. Those comments are always concerning, so we take them seriously, and so as a result, this report will help us move forward so that people will feel, feel that they're working and learning in an environment that's safe. Some of those interviewed said they didn't feel safe making complaints. They thought it would put them out of a future job. One person called it career suicide. The dean said she's looking at that process. If you're in the situation of feeling that you're being harassed or sexually harassed, that's obviously very difficult for anyone. And so as a result, um, they're sometimes not clear on where to go, but we've also provided them information about where they can go, what offices would help them. 
The report made 37 recommendations to change the policies and culture at the school. As you're aware, culture is nebulous to change and it also takes time. So we have to put uh, structures and processes in place in order to be able to uh, find out where the problem is and make the changes and see if we're improving things. The school is under pressure to shape up. They have until spring of 2019 to meet the requirements of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons or have accreditation for one of their key programs revoked. The Dean would not confirm whether any staff members have been disciplined or even how many have been the subject of these complaints. She said for now that information will not be made public. Malone Mullen, CBC News, St. John's. It's a big week for Pride as many cities and towns across the province will be marching, raising flags and celebrity, but a video from Cornerbrook has many people shaking their heads. The video recorded from a dashboard camera shows a couple walking across the street near a rainbow crosswalk by City Hall. The man, as you just saw there, looks at the crosswalk then spits on it. You can see it here more clearly in slow motion. The person who recorded this incident believes the man is intentionally spitting on the Pride Rainbow Crosswalk out of disgust. The video has been seen tens of thousands of times online and is being widely shared. And in the hundreds of comments on Facebook, there is a lot of disbelief that this could be happening in 2018. The co-chair of St. John's Pride has seen the video as well. This was a, you know, a negative target towards the LGBTQ plus community. Then I think this individual, who we still don't know if is a male or female, that they, you know, they, in their disagreement, they can go other routes to do this you know, how, how they feel that it shouldn't be there or why the sidewalk shouldn't be there. The city of Cornerbrook come out and done the sidewalk and for this individual, you know, to, if it is targeting against the community, it is very disheartening to see and it goes to show how much more work we have to do in our community and in our province. Now to see the video again and read about the reaction, go to our website cbc.ca slash nl. The federal and provincial governments announced affordable housing projects this morning. 93 new units will be created. 13 will be fully accessible. Six million dollars is coming from both levels of government. The new units will be constructed throughout the province, including in CBS, Bonavista, Porta Basque and Happy Valley Goose Bay. Conditional approval has been given to 10 private and three non-profit sector groups to construct the units. The Privacy Commissioner says that the province is breaking its own access to information laws. Donovan Malloy told CBC News that Newfoundland and Labrador is exceeding the legal deadlines for responding to access requests. Malloy says in one case it took 86 business days to respond. By law, it should have happened within 20 days. Malloy adds that staff can't keep up with the number of requests, which have nearly tripled while staffing has stayed the same. He says the situation is not likely to change given the state of the province's finances. Tonight, one man's heroic act of self-sacrifice 46 years ago is being recognized. It goes back to the sinking of a schooner and how one crew member saved the lives of six people. Today, the family was presented with the Canadian Red Cross Rescuer Award. Here and now, Stephen Miller has the story that's four decades in the making. In 1972, the schooner Delroy was lost following a fire in the engine room. On board were five crew and ten passengers, including men, women, and children, who were catching a ride to Arnold's Cove. All fifteen were thrust into the sea when the wooden dory they tried to escape in capsized. Nine of them did not survive. Among the six survivors was a child, who survived because of the heroic actions of one crew member. There was one young girl on that ship that survived because of the man that we're here to honor. Leo Bolin was part of a five-member crew on the Delroy that day. He was wearing a life jacket, but he took that life jacket off and gave it to a, a young girl. The Canadian Red Cross Rescue Award is given in cases of bravery shown during rescue efforts by civilians. It was presented today to Bullen's wife and two adult children. It's been almost five decades since the tragedy, but the difficulties of raising two children without a father weighs heavily on Bullen's widow. I had my in-laws for to help me, only for that. It would have been very, very, you know, very hard. But I'm still a widow. 
Howard Bullen was only six when his father was lost at sea. What he knows of his father comes from the stories he's been told over the years. He's been imagining the final moments of a father he hardly knew as long as he can remember. I don't sleep in no time. I can't sleep. I, I was taking that before about her for the last 46 years. The family plans to make a cross in Bullen's memory and place it in the sea where he was lost. One final act to mark his incredible sacrifice. Recently, Chris was able to contact the young girl his father saved, now a woman living in B.C., and witness the result of his father's bravery. I just contacted her there a little while ago. It was the first time I spoke to her, right? And uh, so hopefully I'll be talking to her again, right? But knowing that she's alive and, you know what I mean, makes, makes you feel good too, right? Like you did something, helped somebody out. The pain of losing a parent is forever, but hopefully this recognition offers some sort of closure. Stephen Miller, CBC News, St. John's. Yeah, a little uh, late getting the uh, award, but definitely means so much to that family that you could see there. Yeah, it still resonates all those years later. It's basically you're given bad news, and it's like a bad dream that you cannot wake up from. For a month, his face has been plastered all over, but Trevor Hamlin is still nowhere to be seen. You'll hear from the missing man's family coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, for a month, they've been waiting for a call, a knock at the door, or a tip that could solve the mystery of what happened to Trevor Hamlin. The Hamlin family's middle son, who's more widely known as Pepsi, has been missing for a month now. 200 missing posters plastered all around the St. John's area. Ashley Hamlin, armed with lots of tape and friends, put them up. It's something she never imagined she'd have to do. Her older brother, Trevor, hasn't been seen in a month. One moment, he was in his paradise residence on a Saturday in June. The next, his roommate came home to find him missing. Aside from an old cell phone, extensive searches have turned up empty. Basically, you're given bad news and it's like a bad dream that you cannot wake up from because unfortunately we've come up with no new leads so we don't know where to focus and I feel like we're just stuck. We're in the same place where we were on day one and I don't know how to get unstuck at this point. It was revealed yesterday that one of your search groups found a phone um, about a week after your brother went missing. Uh, what was the significance of that? Basically, that was during our first search. We did find a phone, and once I got home, I found Trevor's original phone package, and we were able to match it up and send it to the police. And they were able to confirm that that was the phone we found. Unfortunately, there was nothing on it, and it's been outside for so long in that. So we don't know how we got there. We don't know if it's significance um, or if it's just a weird coincidence. But as I said, it is his old phone. He still currently has a phone that was with him when he went missing. So we're still looking for that or any other sign of Trevor. You're back to work this week after a month of searching and asking questions and you're really active on social media. What's it like to make the decision to go back and how did you do that? Well, unfortunately, bills still come. That's basically where I got, I was off for a few weeks and dealt with what I had to, you know, doing the interviews and running the family and trying to like help out. I mean, I have my own family that I have to take care of. So it was an easy decision, but still you have to get back to your normal routine eventually. We don't know how long this is going to go on for. I mean, this could be months, it could be years. I hope not, but at the same time, we still need to prepare ourselves. We still need to go on with our lives. You said you're basically back to square one. No bank activity, no signs that he left the province. What what do you think could have happened? Truthfully, we're still playing with so many scenarios. Just for the fact that we don't know when he left or how he left. I mean, if he walked off on his own, that's one thing. And then that's a whole bunch of scenarios. If he met with someone, that's a whole bunch of another scenarios. If he walked off and then someone also met with him and they went off together, like it's hard to tell. It depends which scenario you want to think about. And then that branches into a whole bunch of others. Obviously, we've worked every scenario through our brains. But as I said, there's no facts at this point. There's no evidence. So we don't know what the story is. This is a hard thing to answer, but is there anyone out there who you think would do something to hurt your brother? Truthfully, no. I don't believe that anything like that has happened. I don't believe he went off on his own like he decided to just pack up and leave. As the police have stated, the bank accounts, they have not been touched. There was no large money withdrawal from his account prior to his disappearance. So there's no evidence of that. He did go out that morning. He planned on going somewhere that day. And then he just vanished. What's the next steps for you? Because uh, as you said to me earlier, it's hard to know where to look at this point. So what, what's your next step? My next step is basically, I wanna talk with the police a little bit more. We've been working very close together. I'm also gonna start speaking with some of Courtney Lake's family, try to get some input from them. Cause obviously they have been through this, unfortunately. And they're more experts than I am in this. We're also, you know, still talking to people and still hoping to get some tips and leads. We do plan to do another search. We're just trying to narrow where to do it at this point in time. So hopefully by next weekend, we can have a new place to look. Thank you so much and good luck. Thank you so much. Mariana, police are still looking for any uh, help, assistance from the public, I understand. Yeah, that's right. So if you have surveillance cameras in the area of Imogene Crescent in Paradise Trails End and any dash cam footage, the police would like to speak with you.
The Merbys are back for another year with their glittery beards and sparkly tails. I'll tell you about this year's calendar coming up on Here and Now. Our update is brought to you by Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 570 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. As we often do to start off the weather segment, some video to show you. Very different. This is video from Capelin Cove, Trinity Bay. And it's not Capelin you're seeing, those are jumping cod. It looks like one of those Canadian Heritage Minute ones with John Cabot trying to get the fish. According to uh, Marlene Hardy, who took this video, people were catching the cod right from the beach. Wow, that's amazing. I wonder if there's a bag limit on cod when you're catching them <laughs> like that. Is there a rule? <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't mind getting some of that cod. Yeah, I, I wish mean, I was there. All I can think of is Bert and Ernie. You know, that's good. Here, fishy, 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 fishy. <laughs> Definitely the case in Cape Lagoa Cove where that video was shot. Well, I thought I'd have a look at uh, some of those hot temperatures from yesterday because a bunch of records were broken. Just have a look at this. 
First one we'll look at was Wabush, 29.4 degrees tomorrow, and that breaks the record that was set back in 2000 of 28 degrees. Another record broken in Churchill Falls, 29 degrees yesterday. The former record was at 28.7 there in 2000 as well. And we have Happy Valley Goose Bay, 34.9. So almost 35 degrees, gonna stay really hot there tomorrow as well. And uh, just over 30 degrees in Mary's Harbor as well. So lots of records broken yesterday. And I bet we'll see some uh, broken uh, there tomorrow as well because we still have these really hot temperatures. Uh, here are the highs today, 33 degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay, 30 degrees in Makovic. That is going to be changing for you overnight tonight for sure. And on the island, some great temperatures as well. 29 degrees in Central and uh, here in the East, 24 degrees in St. John's today. So overnight uh, tonight, we are uh, going to be seeing a lot of this start to move in. This is this is a system that's heading our way and it's going to bring this persistent stream of moisture to many areas of the province over the next few days. And once again, we do have this heat warning that is uh, still in effect for central areas as well as parts of the west coast and the northeast coast there. And this fog advisory that is in place all along the south coast, keeping things quite cool down there. And we also have the heat warning in place for parts of Labrador, but things will cool down a little bit tomorrow. So you can see uh, all of those showers that are pushing through uh, Labrador tomorrow, particularly Happy Valley Goose Bay, or rather for tonight into tomorrow. And we also have the showers down along the south coast of the island. So here's a look at how things are shaping up for tonight. Just take a note of Happy Valley Goose Bay overnight tonight, still 19 degrees with those showers. And uh, yeah, that's going to be really muggy. But look at the difference between Nain and Happy Valley Goose Bay tonight. So there is a cold front that is working its way down. We'll cool things down a bit uh, for the southeastern part of Labrador. So as we go through our day tomorrow, lots of shower action you can see right across the island and as well as in Labrador. Now, St. John's, we could see some of those showers tomorrow, but for sure along the south coast of the Avalon, there should be some shower action. But 25 degrees in St. John's tomorrow for uh, central areas uh, looking great. Grand Falls, Windsor, 28 degrees should stay nice and dry there tomorrow. Along the west coast, you can see uh, down along the coastline here, 16 degrees as the high there. So lots of fog will persist tomorrow. And as we head up to the Straits, still those really warm temperatures, a chance of showers uh, there. You can see all along the coast. And as we head into the interior of Labrador, Labrador City, 14 degrees with a chance of showers tomorrow. Churchill Falls, 16 degrees. Happy Valley Goose Bay still staying warm tomorrow, not quite as warm as it was today. And, temper and uh, about five to 10 millimeters of rain. But check out, uh, check out Makovic. It was 30 degrees there today. 11 degrees is the forecast high there tomorrow. So quite the difference in that neck of the woods. I'll have a look at uh, your weekend forecast coming up a bit later. Remember these guys? Let us reintroduce you to the Murbys, members of the Beard and Mustache Club whose 2018 calendar swept across the world in a wave. They were fishing for funds to support better mental health care, and they ended up hauling in a boatload of cash. Well, now they're back looking to make another splash. Here now is Peter Cowan was at their photo shoot in Petty Harbor. The Murabais had so much fun and raised so much money last year that they're back again with their glittery beards and sparkly tails. You, where, do you, where would you like the tail? Right this is the only time of the year these mystical creatures come out, sunning themselves on the rocks by the harbor. The team from the Beard and Mustache Club are back, shooting as many Murabais as they can, with cameras only, of course. It started last year with a dare and a hope of raising a few thousand dollars. But calendars featuring burly men in playful poses captured people's imaginations and raised $300,000. People saw a really playful and a different side of masculinity, which they're not used to seeing in, in particularly big burly fellows. It wasn't hard to convince people to strip down and sparkle up this year. Sure, it's for a good cause. This year the money will go towards a violence prevention initiative in the province. But it's also a lot of fun. Ian Gillis works as a blacksmith, so this is a big departure for him. I think it's almost the epitome of, of you know, 
jovial you know, fun Newfoundlanders and I think it's just so off the wall that you know it struck a chord with everybody it's so obvious that it's fun you know and it's such a probably a contrast to uh, you know our, our daily life you feel the transformation happening I feel sparklier already yeah. Good. excellent I couldn't be the only one with a plain beard so I agreed to let them glitter me up Sure, it's fun and it raises money, but the Beard and Mustache Club also hopes it might change what it means to be masculine. I think it's it's important for all men to show that there's a there's much more to us than this sort of wall that we put up here, this armor that we wear that you know we're big tough guys and that's all there is to us. We are emotional creatures. For the rest of the week, the group is going to be touring the province, making sure that they get a chance to capture merbys throughout Newfoundland and Labrador. Peter Cowan, CBC News, Petty Harbor. <laughs> Vote Peter for the 2020 calendar, perhaps. <laughs> Peter shot that story yesterday, and he says he's still trying to get the glitter out of his beard. Mm -hmm. And as Ian said uh, in that piece, it's so much fun. Everybody knows they, it's fun, <laughs> and yeah. uh, it is for an excellent cause. They've been so successful. They're asked to not smoke when they're at the Waterford or, or the recovery center, and they immediately sort of throw their hands up and say, I'm not going. Just ahead, why smoking near this hospital may be a good thing. Welcome back. People getting mental health and addictions treatment in St. John's need smoking areas. That's according to some frontline health care and outreach workers. They say smoking is clearly bad for you, but not getting treatment for bigger problems is worse. Mark Quinn has that story. It's an odd thing to hear outreach workers calling for health facilities to allow patients to do this. But they say allowing smoking is really about harm reduction. It's kind of a tool that people need to survive and it's not the most urgent thing that we should be dealing with. Keiku Mwumba and Carmela Gray Cosgrove are with Thrive, an organization that helps people with mental health and addictions trouble. They say many people don't seek treatment or even drop out of it because they can't smoke at healthcare facilities. And a barrier that we encounter a lot of the time with our participants is um, that they're asked to not smoke when they're at the Waterford or, or the recovery center. And they immediately sort of throw their hands up and say, I'm not going because I can't smoke while I'm there. 
Once a patient is admitted for treatment, they aren't allowed to leave the premises until their treatment is complete. Thrive has written a letter to Health Minister John Hagee asking for smoking areas at the Waterford and the Recovery Centre. About 70 people have signed it so far, and Hagee says he's considering their proposal. Certainly, uh, anything that represents a barrier to, to addictions or mental health treatment, I'm prepared to look at to try and, and reduce or eliminate. As I say, I still work from the premise that in general, uh, the best thing to do with smoking is to encourage you to cease. The provincial government has promised to build a new psychiatric unit here at the Health Sciences Centre. It says it hopes to start work by 2019. But Greg Cosgrove hopes the no smoking policy will be long gone by then. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Canada's cannabis producers are responding to a crackdown on pot promotion. Last week, Health Canada issued a statement reminding companies that marketing won't be allowed once pot it won't be allowed once pot is legal in October. And that has left some companies wondering what they can and can't do in the meantime. Sabrina Fabian explains. On October 17th, cannabis will be legal and marketing it will be illegal. So some cannabis producers have been racing to get their brands recognized before the Cannabis Act comes into place. And Health Canada is keeping a close eye on them. Here in Nova Scotia, CBC News spoke with the CEO of one company called Aquilitas. They have created a brand called Reef and some subtle branding to go with it. Rainbow bracelets, for example, for this week's Pride Parade in Halifax. Myrna Gillis is planning on wearing one as a way to demonstrate that her company is dedicated to inclusivity, but she would also like to hand them out to adults in the crowd at the parade. She's waiting to hear back from Health Canada for details on what she can and can't do. Regardless, we will be there, you know, and, and uh, whether we're, we're there in our street clothes or whether we're, you know, wearing our, our you know, sort of reef pride <laughs> uh, 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 paraphernalia that we've sort of distributed to our own staff to demonstrate that in our workplace we're inclusive. In the meantime, she's using word of mouth to spread the word about her product. We're kind of doing it the old-fashioned maritime way, which is storytelling. Um, we have a great, compelling story. Um, we have a story about rural economic development. We have a story about innovative technology we've developed here in Nova Scotia. The Cannabis Act only comes into force on October 17th. However, Health Canada says it's keeping a close eye on cannabis producers and their promotions. Companies that do break the law could receive fines ranging from $250,000 to five million dollars. But when asked, Health Canada wasn't clear on whether penalties would be imposed before the October 17th legalization date. A spokesperson said they are taking every possible step to bring cannabis producers into compliance. Sabrina Fabian, CBC News, Halifax.
Time to shine a light on our young athletes of the day, and our first is nine-year-old Cole Welshman from Paradise. Cole is active in karate and participates in many tournaments. And recently, Cole won three gold medals at the annual Iceberg Tournament. He also enjoys swimming, basketball, and takes part in cross-country running and track. Congratulations, Cole. And our uh, second athlete of today is Natalie Newhook from CBS. Oh, I love her dress. <laughs> Natalie is four years old and will be starting her fourth year at Fusion Dance Studio this fall. Oh, okay. She will also uh, be playing soccer this summer in CBS. Congratulations to our young athlete, Natalie. <laughs> Carolyn, you're saying that uh, Labrador is still pretty warm parts Ooh, of it, hey? It is a scorcher up there for sure. I'm going to start with a look at some of the current temperatures. So right now in Happy Valley, Goose Bay, 32 degrees along the coast. Makovic looking at 27 degrees right now. In St. John's, we're sitting at a very comfortable 22 degrees. So we do have this heat warning that is still in effect, as well as the fog advisory along the south coast, keeping things a little bit cool down there. And uh, for Labrador as well, we do have this uh, heat warning that's still in place. Going to stay pretty muggy there overnight tonight. As we head into to tomorrow, we're looking at uh, some showers for Happy Valley Goose Bay, about 5 to 10 millimeters, as well as a possibility of some showers along the south coast of the island. And I uh, could see a few showers in St. John's as well. So this will push in throughout the day in the west. So St. John's looking at a mainly cloudy day, 20 25 degrees as the high in central areas, 28 degrees in Grand Falls, Windsor, and that chance of showers there along the west coast. And for Labrador, once again, 5 to 10 millimeters of rain expected there tomorrow, 25 degrees, so not quite as warm as it was today, but still on the warm end of the scale. And Nade, you can see just north of that, just 9 degrees tomorrow, so quite the difference in temperatures. As we uh, head into Wednesday evening and Thursday, you can see these showers coming up through uh, the east, eastern portion of the island and yeah so we're gonna have a pretty persistent stream of wet weather over the next couple of days temperatures still staying pretty warm in the east 23 degrees on uh, Thursday afternoon 28 in central areas but yes we do have that chance of showers throughout the day on Thursday sun and cloud in eastern Labrador very comfortable 23 degrees and a chance of showers in western Labrador and 18 as the high on Thursday Day. So as we head into uh, to Friday and into our weekend, Friday you can see on the island is looking pretty good. Not so much in Labrador. We do have those showers uh, moving in there. We, we could have a chance of morning showers in the east on Friday, but then things should clear off nicely. Cloudy skies for central and 27 degrees for the west, 24 in eastern Labrador with a chance of showers there. So as we head into the weekend, how are things looking? So far, so good, particularly in the east Saturday Sunday looking a little bit more cloudy on Saturday but 22 degrees as the high I'll take that for sure and uh, Sunday 20 degrees for the east for central very similar picture uh, there temperatures in the low 20s but at least it's nice and dry and what a great stretch here for western Labrador getting up to 30 degrees on Saturday so hopefully this forecast will hold for you guys western Labrador Saturday definitely looks like the better day of the two if you're going to get out and do anything and uh, for eastern Labrador you can see a lovely weekend as well and temperatures returning to that 31 degree mark that's your weather Debbie back to you Thank you, Carolyn. Well, the recent a wave of hot weather in parts of the country means patio season for many, but finding seasonal workers to meet the extra demand in restaurants is getting more difficult. And that's leading some in the industry to find more creative solutions. The CBC's Mickey Cowan has more. Hot weather Vancouver patios get so busy they have lineups down the block. So then why are there still sometimes empty tables and closed sections? The BC Restaurant and Food Services Association says it all relates back to staffing. So we just have a shortage of workers that's systemic, whether it's during the summer or during the winter. 
The summer is particularly sticky because many restaurants need to nearly double their workforce. The Restaurant Association says a shift in demographics in B.C. is making that difficult, especially for the typical restaurant hiring age group of 15 to 24 year olds. A new report by the association shows people are having fewer kids and baby boomer workers are retiring. We actually did a study and um, in the last six months and we're seeing that for every three people that retire, we're only uh, putting two people back into the economy, so we we're about a third short. Tostenson says the shortage is leading restaurants to try different solutions. Restaurants like Vancouver's Tap and Barrel. Their newest location opened over the weekend, but you won't see servers here. It's all counter service, where you line up at the bar, order your food, and take a number. Labor has always been the biggest issue in, in this industry as long as I've been in it. Uh, finding great people and retaining great people. But it's been a lot more difficult just to find the bodies lately. The move greatly reduces the number of staff the restaurant needs to operate, which makes a big difference to the bottom line. This is Brew Hall. We have about 100 staff here. Uh, in comparison, if this was a full service restaurant, we would have about 200 staff under the same roof. Frankel is also setting his sights elsewhere to find workers. He's in contact with the ambassador of El Salvador and has an invite from their labor minister. The goal is to work with culinary institutes and eventually bring them back here to help out with our insatiable demand for workers and dining alike. Mickey Cowan, CBC News, Vancouver. From beer, cheese and maple syrup to restrictions on trucking and meat shipments, intra-provincial trade has proven difficult in this country. A Canadian free trade agreement came into effect last year, but there are still hurdles. They'll be discussed at the annual Premier's meeting later this week. Today, during a visit to Nova Scotia, the Prime Minister weighed in kind of frustrating, not just uh, for Canadians, but for me, to see uh, continued barriers to internal trade uh, in Canada. If we want to uh, continue to demonstrate that we know that free trade is good for citizens, good for workers, uh, good for consumers, uh, good for our economy, uh, then we need to do a better job of, uh, of uh, doing it here in Canada. Trudeau notes that while Canada is in the midst of protracted NAFTA negotiations, it would really help to ease challenges at home. The Bank of Canada estimates trade barriers between provinces suck billions out of the economy. The Premier's Council of the Federation meeting takes place in New Brunswick Thursday and Friday. Canada's telecom watchdog wants to hear from people who've had bad experiences with big service providers. And now there are more details about how and when it's going to do that. The CRTC is asking consumers, along with current and former telecom employees, to weigh in on whether they've experienced misleading or aggressive sales tactics. Individuals have until the end of next month to submit written com comments, and a public hearing will get underway in Gatineau, Quebec, in October. The federal government ordered the CRTC last month to hold the inquiry following a series of stories by CBC's Go Public team about high-pressure sales tactics. Former U.S. President Barack Obama was in South Africa, speaking at celebrations one day ahead of what would be Nelson Mandela's 100th birthday tomorrow. And while his speech focused on Mandela's history and legacy, it also included references to some vexing contemporary political challenges. You have to believe in facts. <coughs> Without facts, there's no basis for cooperation. If I say this is a podium and you say this is an elephant, it's going to be hard for us to cooperate. Politicians have always lied. But it used to be if you caught them lying, they'd be like, oh, man. Now they just keep on lying. They, they just... Obama used his address to warn of the risk of economic and political stagnation as efforts toward global integration come under siege. He maintains the only way to check climate change, mass migration and pandemic diseases is to develop more systems for international cooperation. 
He also noted complications in international relations due to the rise of state-sponsored propaganda, internet-driven fabrications, and the blurring of lines between news and entertainment. Nearly two dozen people were injured in Hawaii when a blob of hot lava struck an ocean tour boat just off Big Island. This is new video into us just this morning taken by one of the passengers on board that boat the moment when the lava hit. The boat was taking tourists to see the erupting Kilauea volcano when a chunk of molten lava went flying towards them. Wow. The fog advisory may be for the south coast of the island, but the Narrows saw some intense fog yesterday. Makes it look almost ghostly at Fort Amherst. Very nice. Where is it? <laughs> <laughs> I think we can all guess that one. That's gorgeous. <laughs> We're going to have a look at that picture again. Yeah, it's gorgeous. <laughs> the fog rolling in on Fort Amherst. This was uh, yesterday. Larry Daly sent that into us. Thank oh, okay. you so much for that. And if you have any photos you'd like to send in, uh, just email it to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Great. Thanks so much. And uh, we're going to dip out a little bit or nip out a little bit earlier tonight uh, because we have a tune to leave you with. The band Partner is a musical duo with a connection to this province. Lucy Niles is from Happy Valley Goose Bay. And Partner is one of 10 shortlisted acts in the running for the 50 thousand dollar Polaris Music Prize. <laughs> CBC Music will live stream the Polaris Music Gala on September 17th. All right. Now, now here's a partner with Play the Field. Good, Good night. night.